when I heard that what is growing here at Hawkwood is this Centre for Future Thinking, I absolutely rejoiced because it's exactly what's needed now is to gather all those who are seriously envisioning and preparing for a future world that's going to work for all. We need a centre for it and this is it. So I, I'm going to ask you right now to take two precious minutes, close your eyes, uncross your legs, and simply arrive in this room. We're not going to have time to ask everybody to say how they really are in this moment, which I would normally do, because there's too many of us. So I'm just going to ask you to take what will now be just one blessed, totally quiet minute to arrive. Close your eyes, if you will, and simply be in this room where we are now. And bring to your heart one word for how you really are. Thank you so much. Uh, I brought these flowers from my garden because I love to have something of the outside inside. Um, and my um, task this morning is to acquaint you with a fairly new organisation. Its name is Rising Women, Rising World. And when I'm talking about that, it does not for a moment exclude, it rather includes and welcomes men. And um, there are a number of reasons why this organisation has started and started now. So I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll do a little exercise in pairs and then I'll talk for another five minutes or so and then we'll have a Q&A. So hopefully those who have questions will have a good chance to express them. One of the reasons why we formed this organisation is that we realised that the crises and the challenges that face us right now are so severe that they clearly can't be solved, and I use that word advisedly, they can't be resolved or transformed without a massive shift in consciousness. This is what Einstein talked about when he said, no <coughs> problem can be solved by the consciousness that created it. So this calls on us, and I think most people in this room are probably aware of it, to make not just a shift, but a leap in consciousness. This means accessing awareness that we haven't accessed before. And this is inner work for outer action. And as Jonathan was saying earlier, Many of us who have been trying to, in quotes, save the world for the last 40, 50 years have been driven by anger or fear. I certainly have in the past. And what I realise is that unless we work with those powerful emotions inside ourselves, we are likely in our activism to spew them out on other people. So the inner digestion and beautiful work with powerful emotions, with our self-knowledge and self-awareness is vital. And rising women, rising world, uh, that's one of the, if you like, the basic foundations on which we build what we do. The other is that anyone who observes the last 3,000 years can see that decisions have been dominated 
by the masculine principle. The principal decision makers in the world have uh, been very largely male. When, when I did a, a who's who of nuclear weapons policy makers in 1988, for which we got our organization, the Oxford Research Group, got banned by the Ministry of Defense, <laughs> there were 650 uh, decision makers in all the then nuclear nations that was then Britain, China, what was then the Soviet Union, United States and France, 650 decision makers of whom five were women. And I went and interviewed them and their way of thinking was indistinguishable from their male colleagues because they had had to adapt. And that's the same is true for men. They have to adapt to the existing system and many of them feel very uncomfortable in it. So the second foundation on which Rising Women, Rising World is built is this question of balancing rebalancing yin with yang. I, I would really appreciate your uh, ideas later on today, I'll be here all day, uh, in finding better words than male, female, masculine, feminine, yin, yang even. Yin, yang is the closest I've come because what we're not talking about is gender. Because as we know, men have just as great access to the, fem the deep feminine principles as women do and vice versa. So what we're looking for is a balance between yin and yang, not only in us personally, but in the work that we do and the world that we build. Um, and it, the more you look at what Juliet has just been so articulately describing and what's being described all throughout this festival is that what we're dealing with is a very heavily yang society and a very heavy, heavily yang influence and a very heavily yang decision making. So what we want to see is how the deep feminine principles in men and women come back into balance. And thirdly, we want to call on a far greater intelligence than anything that is in my tiny brain to inform and power what we do because it's perfectly clear, just have to look outside at the massive intelligence that informs a tree, that nature and the world that surrounds us has a huge, uh, vast source of powerful intelligence which is actually available at our disposal. If you just try calling on it, you'll be astonished by what happens. Many of you have already done so. So what we're doing in Rising Women, Rising World is building a, an envisaging, a story, a picture, just like Charles was describing yesterday, of how the future can be if the two principles come into balance. So we've identified 12 extremely wise people in all continents and cultures of the world, each of whom has spent a lifetime developing knowledge and expertise on one or another subject, economics, education, the arts, business, indigenous cultures, uh, sport, health, and so on. So I'm going to pass around for you in a moment um, a little note of the biographies of some of these extraordinary people. Um, and you can see um, how, the, how carefully we've tried to include people from Aotearoa, New Zealand, from China, uh, from India, from Brazil, as well as from the Northern Hemisphere. So three copies there, if, you can, if we send one this way. And just have a look at them as I'm talking and you'll, you'll see. Um, yeah, th there's only three copies, so that's, yours, uh, that's probably yeah. mine, and I think that's probably mine. Is yeah. that the Great. same as that? Yeah. Those yes, are those three are the same. same. Mm -hmm. um, just to give you an idea of this wealth of wisdom that's at our disposal, and what we've asked each person to do is to sketch out her envision envisioning of how the world could be based on very 
practical examples. So in each case, and if you look on our website, you'll see it, this vision of the future is in no way airy-fairy. It is based on what's already happening and what already works. So each person's been asked to supply somewhere between three and ten examples of how this is already happening. So you get the feeling, uh, for example, people have been talking about transition towns, and that, to my way of thinking, is a brilliant example of how community change happens locally. So um, that's, that's one part. That is to... Um, my great mentor was a nuclear physicist called Joseph Rotblatt, and he said to me, the future belongs to those who can see it. And if you ask most people today, what kind of future do you think we're going to have, they kind of shrug and say, more of the same, I suppose, which is grim. It's grim, it doesn't inspire, it doesn't energise. Whereas if we've got a future that we can think of and picture and see, um, and if we have time, I'll, I'll, I'll convey a little bit of it to you uh, later on. Um, the other um, uh, offering that we have is education. Um, we pioneered over the last two and a half years a course which is called Inner Action. And it's based on how we, um, how we go through five stages to really identify and be able to carry out what we are longing to contribute to the world. What each person who participates can contribute to the world. Because many, many people come and say, oh, I, I desperately want to do something. What can I do? So what we do is put, take people through five stages. The first one, can you hear all right? This microphone seems to be muffling a bit. No, it's, fine. it's all right. The first stage is gratitude. Anybody, any of you who know Joanna Macy's work will know that we start with immense gratitude. We are so blooming privileged, every one of us in this room, to be safe, nobody's sh shooting at us, nobody's going to string us up for an email that we send tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We've got enough to eat, we've got a roof over our heads, and we're safe. So we've got an enormous privilege available to us. So gratitude we start with. The second is awakening to the pain and suffering of the world. What Jonathan was talking about earlier. Anybody who wants to make a difference has to be willing to walk towards what is awful. It's no good just going, I can't bear to watch the news. We need to know what's happening. And we need to identify what part of it we want to offer our skills to. But we can't do that by denial. So I encourage everybody to see, to look for <coughs> what breaks your heart and bring your skills to that. Because it's that passion in your heart that is going to give you the energy and the drive to keep going when the, when the going gets tough and the going will get tougher. So we need that fuel from inside of, of the heart passion. And for everybody it's different. For some people it's children, for other people it's climate, for other people it's the banking system, etc. And um, what we do in the course is to, once people have identified what that passion is, then to take a real hard look at their skills and hone them with some guidance and some mentoring into the project that re they really want to do. Because we have to move from the general and the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness to the specific of what my capacities make me able to contribute. Um, so these courses are two-day courses, um, and it's called Inner Action. You can find it on the Rising Women website. And what we're also doing now is training facilitators to deliver this course all over the world. Mm -hmm. So we've 
uh, that's a five-day course, and the facilitators have to have certain qualifications before we can take them on as trainee facilitators. They're quite tough, um, because we want this to be of the highest standard. And we've now got facilitators offering these courses in Canada, Geneva, shortly in South America, um, and I very much hope in India at Christmas time. So um, it's we're, we're quite young. We only started where we even thought of it exactly three years ago, and only really got going two years ago. Um, so um, yeah, th we also use. Um, uh, the web. Um, I did a webinar on something called the Shift Network in America, who have a terribly hard sell way of delivering their courses, but they, they do do good things. And that was a seven week webinar that you can still log into, I think, um, basically delivering the same material as the Interaction course. Um, and the thing that fascinates me now, and I'm sure many of you will also be fascinated with it, is something called a MOOC. Anybody know what MOOC is? Yeah. Massive online open course. And I would love to hone this material into one of those that can then be offered globally uh, in ways that can be uh, accepted and, and digested by people of many different cultures. That's on the horizon. Um, so now I'd like to ask you to uh, do an exercise in pairs, which is a kind of mini version of what we do on the course. We do a wonderful exercise which is enabling people to really listen. Because we all think we're good listeners, and most of us are not. Um, and the great benefit of giving someone else your full attention for, in this case, it'll be just a couple of minutes, but in the longer exercise, it's 20 minutes, um, to actually give someone your full attention is the greatest gift you can give them. And it has immense benefits for you. Namely, by listening to someone else completely, you are stepping out of your self-centric circle into the area of the other. That means you're moving from me to we which is essential for all this work. To move from me, my little concerns, emotions, my world, my exasperations, to what is true for us? What can we do? What do we need to do together? The speaker who is being listened to in this way discovers gems because he or she discovers things that they didn't know they knew. Because when you speak from your gut instead of from your brain, your gut delivers a truth to you that's often very surprising. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn to your neighbour. Um, people in the, in, the, in the row can also do exactly that, uh, and at the back. And I will ask you to, each one of you in turn, and it'll only be two minutes each, I'm sorry, because of the lack of time, to give your deepest possible answer to the question, who am I really? Who am I really? So I want you now to turn to your partner. Anybody who doesn't have a partner, put your hand up quickly. And off we will go. No partner? Somebody at the back. All right, are you ready? Somebody at the back needs a partner. When I raise my hand, we're going to be quiet. Please all raise your hands when you're ready to be quiet. Beautiful, thank you. So if you're ready to go now, two minutes for the first person, then I'll ring the bell and raise my hand and we'll change over. So person A, Ask yourself the question, who am I really? And tell your partner from your gut what the truth of that is. The partner simply gives you full attention. Please start now.
Thank you. Now change over and the other partner ask him or herself, who am I really? And tell the truth of that to your partner. Please start now. Thank you so much. Um, it's do hold on, do hold on to the energy that you've generated doing this exercise because it generates phenomenal energy. Just telling the real, honest, uh, stark truth about who you really are to mm. another person. Mm. It's very, very lovely, and we do a lot of it in our courses. I'm just going to go on now to tell you um, how we are spreading this idea globally. Uh, we've developed what we, what we call constellations, and I'm using it a little differently to the way Juliet used it earlier. Um, we've created these um, nodes, if you like, or constellations around each of the 12 subjects. And for example, here's education, and our um, wonderfully knowledgeable, wise person here is Menakshi Gopinath in New Delhi. She's the principal of Lady Sri Ram College there. And what she's developing around her is a constellation of younger people who are all starting up projects to build an education worthy of the future. Uh, because that's been her pioneering knowledge. So she coaches them, mentors them, and enables them to set up their project. And we're now trying to raise money to, if we can, generate a little seed money for these various projects that are springing up. So if you multiply this by 12, <coughs> um, and her mentorees could be from any country. It's all done by Skype and the internet now. So they could be from any country. So she could be mentoring somebody in Brazil who's developing an education program for um, forest schooling for children in, in Rio uh, at the same time as somebody in China doing something that's equally new and future building as that. Um, so when the 12 new projects are on their way, the task for them now is to use the mentoring skills they've learned to mentor another 12. So in that way, it will spread exponentially. Um, this is all in order to use the energy that's coming up from below now. <coughs> I, I'm, I used to work always with top-down systems, Ministry of Defense being a cardinal one, um, and trying to influence that process. And I believe that is, that is still possible. Uh, we, we, Jonathan talked about it earlier. But I, what I sense in all the work that I do is that there is this huge current that nobody has measured coming up from below like green shoots through concrete. Uh, and it's particularly evident in social entrepreneurs. I, I spend quite a lot of time training young people from all over the world in the soft skills that they need to make their entrepreneurial ventures uh, both healthy and clean and clear as well as effective. The, um, the other thing that really excites me is, uh, is millennials. Uh, the recent research that's been done on people born between 1980 and 2000 is that they have a different set of priorities to their predecessors. This was research done by Deloitte and um, even one of the big banks, I think, and KPMG. 
and they found that the priorities of millennials put people, planet, and purpose, purpose in your work, before profit. So this is now giving a lot of CEOs sleepless nights. <laughs> <laughs> because if you want to attract people, you have to model that. You have to be an example of that. Um, and a wonderful young woman called Darshita Gillis, who was born in Mumbai, uh, at the in the, as she puts it, the bottom 1% of the population, is now pioneering a scheme called the Regeneration Generation, based on the fact that we have to go a long way beyond sustainability now. We have to assist and support the planet to regenerate. That means reforesting, cleaning up waters, cleaning up oceans, and enabling what nature does so beautifully to continue to thrive. So um, Darshita has just begun on that, and she's pretty unstoppable. Um, she's, she's, oh, she says, I'm a little miracle. She's tiny and <laughs> an absolute ball of energy. Um, and so uh, the last thing that I'd like to mention is my dream app. Um, <laughs> and, and just see if this lands with any of you. For a long, long time, I've wanted to know whether the crises and challenges that we're facing now all over the world is actually engendering and enabling us to make this shift in consciousness that I started with. In other words, are we waking up fast enough to enable humanity to continue? The planet will manage, always does. But are we waking up quickly enough? Um, so and nobody seems to have a clue how that's happening. So I uh, had this idea of developing an app that would ask, say, 10 questions. Uh, and the questions would be things like, are you prepared to cut your carbon emissions by 10% a year? Uh, do you volunteer in a project in your community or your locality or in your, in your, in your nation? Are you giving your time? Are you contributing? Um, do you have a regular practice of self-reflection, yoga, working with what's going on inside? Because, uh, as I've said, that's vital to this kind of work. Um, so ten questions. If you can tick, say, six of them, you then appear as a point of light on Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Three effects. Three effects. First one is local. Local meaning that you will then be able to see the people in your street or your village who think like you do, get together with them, lift schemes, all the rest. Second, effect on your government. Because your government, particularly our government, has no idea about what's happening at this level. Um, and what this will show <coughs> is not only that there is these millions of people with these attitudes and preferences and priorities, but it's growing like that. And that gets important for your votes in 2020. Thirdly, the effect on corporations and producers. Because if you know that there's a market out there growing like that for ethical sourcing, for fair trade, for treating your employees properly, um, for pu putting people, planet and purpose before profit, mm -hmm. then that may shift the way you do things. Uh, nobody, as far as I know, has been able to quantify this so far. So I am looking for an app developer who is good enough, got to be top class, <laughs> and gets it why we're doing this in order to get this going. In order to... <coughs> qualify that it's worthwhile doing, because the first question an app developer asks you is how you're going to launch this. I listed all the organisations who have membership that I thought might be interested in sending this out to their members to get it started. And I thought, well, maybe there'll be, I don't know, 20 or 30 million altogether, and if one put all the memberships together of all those organisations. We haven't finished counting yet, and it's already over 150 million. 
Um, so that's a reasonable start to, to get uh, something like that out there and working. So I'm going to pause there and see what questions may have bubbled up for you because we've got about 10 minutes and I would love to hear your voices. So, yes. I wanted to find out a bit more about when you're talking about the um, yin yang, the masculine, and feminine, especially because of what you're doing around the um, women rising and that. Thank you. you want a, a bit more on yin and yang? Yeah, just a bit more in terms of where, how you see the, us all connecting to what that means. Where okay. Well, <coughs> we've had long discussions on what are the the principles, if you like, of the deep feminine, and. Um, some people will, will be quite glib about them. I mean, obviously, it includes things like compassion. All these properties, I would say, are equally available to, to the masculine gender. Um, where I think there's particular mileage is the fact that women's bodies every month are in tune with the earth and the moon. And we have a natural... Um, connection, if we allow it, to nature's power. And to my way of thinking, drawing on that power I is what can give, in this case, women back the power that we have systematically lost or been deprived of over the centuries. Because when you think back to the great slaughter of healers and midwives in the Middle Ages all over Europe, um, that wiped out uh, generations of wise women. And they were drawing their expertise and their knowledge and their healing powers from their connection with the earth and with nature. So that would be an ext uh, one that is particularly connected with women. But there are so many qualities that are missing, in particularly in our working lives, that really do need valuing. Issues like inclusivity. In other words, not always thinking about competition, thinking about the value of working with people we don't agree with. So one of the things we teach is a version of nonviolent communication. In other words, how do you communicate with people that you violently disagree with? Such brilliant skills. Um, and I, 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 can, I can send you a whole, a whole list of these principles. But as I say, the vast majority of them are utterly available to men. And, and men have a deep closeness with nature just as we do. So everything that Rising Women, Rising World does is with men. We've, we've talked a lot about whether we should change the, the title or not, but we can't find other words yet, so maybe some of you can help. Anybody else? Why not rising feminine? We did think about that, um, and I um, can't remember the reason it wasn't incorporated yet, but it might be coming. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes? You might not uh, be able to get it. Can you shout? Because we're short of time. That was probably the reason. Yeah. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Somebody back there? Rising people, rising planet. Rising people, rising planet, yes. But we need some way of identifying this, the deep feminine that's been ignored for so long. Yes. I really think we need to mark yeah. that. Ignored for too long. No, ignored for too long, yeah. Ignored for too long. Um, as a, a Um, been connected like uh, the first time ever I noticed connected at different levels, not just sort of sexually mm. or emotionally, mm. but they're like other mm. little lights being switched on. Mm. And he said that he realised he's got hooked into a new age thing where men are doing very much a lot of work <coughs> in their femininity. He was now going to step back in to go and explore masculinity and his power and all the fear and the shame that we feel because we hold these things. So Beautiful. Mm. Oh. 
<coughs> I'm so glad you said that. And there's a, there's a wonderful organisation called Noble Men that is holding retreats for men to do exactly that. To add a little thought to that, I, I do a lot of speaking and activism, and, and I get a lot of projection of people say to me, you have a very strong masculine side. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's all I need to say. It's, it's a, to be careful not to go too far the other way in, in separating these things. It's why some women don't not be feminists. Exactly. And you could also say, I have a very strong feminine side too. <laughs> that was why I left in the air. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, there's somebody back there. Could, could you get up and shout, do you think? Because it's difficult to get the mic to you. Could you say some more about millennials? Yes. Um, uh, how many people are millennials here? Great. <laughs> Terrific. <coughs> Not enough of you. Bring your friends. Yeah. Your children, <laughs> my son. <laughs> um, I was stunned by this research that Darshita dug up. Um, as I said, it was... Um, KPMG, all sorts of reputable people who wouldn't necessarily want this information, <laughs> but that's what they found. Um, and um, what, we, what Darshita and I are doing <coughs> is a system to put two millennials on the board of directors of every public company. Yeah. <laughs> and on all the councils of the United Nations and on all government select committees as their position would be guardians for future generations. Mm. Yeah. So that's the, I the wisdom of the indigenous peoples who said every decision you make should be made with the interests of the seventh generation. I'm a councillor of something called the World Future Council which is 50 of us from different walks of life uh, who gather um, once a year, but mainly we all sit on different commissions. Um, and the commission I'm on has been on, on the future. And we found out that Israel, interestingly, Hungary and Wales all had what they call ombudspersons for future generations who would hold the interests of future generations and have some clout. Um, so this is an extension of that idea much more widely. And the reason that I love the extension of it is imagine how these uh, regeneration generation members could network with one another and leverage that network. In other words, if you were on the board of Goldman Sachs, or um, Barclays Bank, uh, you would be in contact with your opposite numbers on bank boards throughout the world or, uh, or Unilever, which is really setting the pace in this area. Um, and you would, be, you would be knowledgeable about what other companies are doing and be able to talk about that as leverage on the board that you're sitting on. Um, I, I will um, I'll write up Darshita's email later on, um, if I can find it. I think I've got my computer, yes, I'll do that. Um, so, last question. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I can get it to you. Well, thank you. Um, yes, I've been incredibly and reasonably very aware of the, dare I say, plight of many 14-year-olds you know, uh, 12, 13, 14 year olds, that, that age, they are so vulnerable mm. um, in some shape or shape. Mm. You know, they, it's just like an, uh, uh, a treadmill yeah. goes down. And, it re and mm. I think it's really a quite sensible approach. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Um, just in response to that, if I may, I will read you a little bit about the of out of the combined vision that, that we have. So, if you want to just close your eyes, and I'm going to tell you a story for three minutes before we finish. Um, and this is <coughs> our imagination of the future. In every kindergarten and primary school, children are taught nonviolent communication so that they learn quickly how to resolve and transform any crisis that arises, like bullying in the playground. They teach their parents the skills they've learned. 
They learn how to recognize when they are in fear mind and how to locate and transform those emotions and to have the chance to switch to love mind if they so wish. Children and high school students all learn the value for them of quietness, of slowing their minds by a regular practice at school before lessons. This enables them to arrive, to be here now, which will last them their whole lives. The Dalai Lama says that if every child learned to meditate, war would be wiped out in 30 years. Imagine a world in which all educational initiatives recognize the wisdom that the true voyage of discovery lies not merely in seeking new landscapes, but having new eyes. Such an education would aim to free all learners from the shackles of prejudice, ignorance and hubris, and set them on a path of self-discovery expansiveness and the quest for mental and spiritual abundance that invites a worldview grounded in respect for nature and all species on the planet. So there's, there's about six pages of, of this vision from all different aspects, from the scientific right through to the financial world and right through to the arts uh, communication and indigenous wisdom. Um, so the, the first version of it is up on the website of Rising Women. It's the website is just Rising Women, Rising World, or one word, dot org. Uh, and the first version of this vision is up there, but I've just finished putting together with my colleagues a next version, which I hope to finish next week, and then that will go up. So you all very, very much for being here, and um, I hope this information has been useful to you.